So um, I was asked to um, to give a little talk about the um, the adjuncts that we do use um, and the prosthesis and the chest wall reconstruction. And I guess this could have been a very very long lecture, but I I just decided to give a little bit of a flavour. I am not going to present any of my results because they are perfect, and uh, and there's no there's no issue in doing that. But I think again, <coughs> we could spend some time on on discussing uh, what might be the most suitable, um, essentially, um, prosthesis that we can use in chest wall reconstructions, depending on the pathology. There's no doubt that we have become ourselves more wild and more skilled um, as the years have gone by, and we have been operating now people that we wouldn't dare operating 20 or 30 years ago. There's no doubt about that. But quite often, uh, being, uh, being ourselves um, essentially so aggressive, we've been left with huge defects sometimes that we have to sort out, and we have to sort them out for several reasons. So there's no doubt that in many units, people deal with trauma, and they will have to, to deal with the acute trauma situations, um, in which case, obviously, um, you have to sometimes replenish the soft tissues that people might have lost during the injury, or you might have to breach or stabilize the chest wall and the osseous elements. There's no doubt about that. And in that situation, you have to use a combination of prosthesis. Sometimes, some of us are faced, actually, with trauma situations that they come up in the beginning, and they look absolutely fine, and we, look, we do a CT scan, there is, no, there is no discontinuation of the rib cage, and then months later, you get this unilateral pot belly, and these are one of the most difficult things to deal with. And in those situations, obviously, sometimes prosthesis can be, can be helpful in helping these people because the respiratory, um, essentially, um, function has gone down, and obviously, cosmetically, is not the best results that they could have. There's no doubt, as I said, that quite often we have ourselves to dismantle part of the chest. This is a patient that we have had to take a very large um, intercostal muscle flap uh, for a very complex um, bronchial, um, essentially, um, treatment that we gave him. And quite, o quite often you might find that when you take large flaps, these people might end up with a gap which might be a little bit difficult to close. And, th and then you are faced with a situation where you have to do chest wall construction, not because you have removed part of the chest wall for the chest wall, but for another reason. And um, we do have situation, obviously, that we ourselves get with infections or inflammatory diseases of the chest, and we are actually sometimes um, forced to drill holes into the chest um, to deal with the, with the infection, but later on, we have to come back and sort out our mess. This is our bread and butter. These are the people, obviously, that they might have primary or secondary disease on their chest wall. In those situations, obviously, we have to remove the disease, and then we have to replace it with something. And in those situations, you have to remove, obviously, um, the osseous elements of the chest wall and the soft tissue elements, and you can take sternum, ribs, cartilages, muscle, or diaphragm. And last but not least, we do have people with congenital diseases that, obviously, um, when we fix pectuses, then again, we might have to use prosthesis or adjuncts in that situation. So there's a lot of papers why we have to do that. There's no doubt that we have to reestablish the um, stability and the rigidity of the thoracic cage and to protect, the, um, protect people from having any organ herniation. Obviously, you have to protect the respiratory function. And nowadays, people are much, much more demanding as far as the cosmetic results are concerned. They don't want only the disease treated, but they want to look good when they leave this hospital if we keep them alive. So this is a huge question, and I think we could spend around about six years talking about it. I don't think that we do have a consensus. Each and every one of us has declared his own protocols and his own way of fixing or having indications about fixing defects, and this is how we go. There's no doubt when we, we all should agree that when we do have apical defects, there's no need to, um, to fix them. But when we go, as we start migrating towards, obviously, the inferior part of the hemithorax and the anterior part of the hemithorax, and as soon as we start migrating also to the anterior part and we, we have a discontinuation between the sternum and the ribs or a big gaps, in those situations, obviously, we have to find a way of bridging those gaps uh, and providing a stability. These are things that we've been using for the last 70 or 80 years, I guess. Either the bone grafts, which could be split ribs or iliac crest, um, and then, obviously, we, we have used for several years facial grafts, but also our counterparts in plastic surgery um, have found those ones very important, which is facialata or dura. I don't think that the thoracic fraternity uses a lot of this um, at the moment. Then, obviously, muscle flaps. I think the small percentage of us know how to do those, and then usually we get a... Um, we, we get a plastic surgeon to help us out, so we are politically correct, but al also 
in a situation where we are legally sound so we don't end up into trouble. And then obviously there is a large armamentarium of different flaps that we can use, either pedicles or free. But those are not always readily available. Sometimes the people we operate, they do not have the most appropriate nutritional status. So there is a limitation of what we can use. The good thing is obviously that we use the patient's own tissue. The disadvantage is that we extend an operation quite drastically sometimes because we as thoracic surgeons, we tend to be a little bit faster than our plastic colleagues, that they can spend five hours to actually mobilize a flap and put it in place, where they have a break for half an hour for tea or coffee to see whether it is well revascularized. If we look into the alloplastic now reconstruction, I think this is the way that we have been going over the last 20 or 30 years. And I think it is, the reason that we've done it is because as Cefolio said, is because we teamed up with, uh, with the industry. We asked questions and they tried to provide <coughs> answers for us. And that's, that's why technology came in. Obviously, the, the advantages of using um, allographic mater alloplastic materials is because they might be available on the shelf. So, and it doesn't take such a long process as the, as the autographs that we do have. So you don't need to have a donocyte. You can have huge defects essentially sorted out and you can reduce your operating time and go home early. Sometimes I put this slide on because in our quest of producing something perfect, because we always want to, we, we want an alloplastic material that will exhibit all those characteristics. And essentially it will be rigid, malleable enough, ready loosened, and also cheap and cheerful that will keep the managers of the hospital very happy, but also it will not act as a foreign body. As soon as you stick it into the human body, it will incorporate itself, it will stay there forever, because we all know when we have done this kind of surgery for a long period of time, you might have good short-term results, but it might come and hit you five or six or seven or eight <coughs> years even later and have, and have problems. Why? It is very obvious because sometimes you do reconstructions with very heavy materials and you have a tissue that does not allow itself to integrate within it. What you do is you create simple pockets and then it's a matter of time when those pockets decide to go really ugly and then you, you will end up with a sinus thinking, wait a minute, it was all good for four or five years, but now it has come back to bite me. So this is one of the issues that we do have, I guess, from the materials that we use. If we look at the meshes and the composite implant, yes, we do have the polypropylene, proline, Gore-Tex. I can, I can go on, there is a very long list. And if you look at each and every one of them, for those that they have used them, there are certain advantages and disadvantages. For example, you use polyglycolic acid. If you use it in a very large quantity, you're gonna have a lot of lactic acids, um, essentially production. You might have a huge inflammatory area into the area where you have operated. You put it in, a, in, a radio, in, in an area which has been irradiated and not well revascularized, you <coughs> might have problems with infection. PDFE Gore-Tex, very good to put it in. It takes around about 20 minutes to, to fix a defect of 20 by 20 centimeters, but you create a natural physical barrier between two layers of tissue. You create a pocket, and if you're lucky enough to keep it sterile, that's fine and well, but if that pocket becomes infective, then you have to go and take it out, and it's obviously a lot of problems in that situation. So all in all, I don't think that we have any level three or other evidence that there is any specific superiority. I think it comes at the end of the day on a, on a surgeon, on a surgeon, preferences. So if we look at the composite implant and meshes, I think infections is one of the things that I fear most myself and the fact that you cannot treat them conservatively when they get infected. You have to go in and take it and take it out and that might hurt your pride a little bit but this is something that you essentially have to do. Now as far as the bioprosthetic materials, there are at least 12 approved products in the, in the States. There are a little bit more um, in, um, in, the, in, the, in, um, in the European continent. And then we do have obviously the two large groups, which are the allografts made from cadaveric dermal allografts and the, and the xenografts from porcine or bovine products that we do have. They are a little bit better because they're not synthetic. I think they do integrate into the native tissues, you get a good structural integrity and they're more resistant into infection. <coughs> if we look at the um, most common ones um, that have been used, um, Alloderm and Flex HD from Ethicon, I think they are, they are really good. They come up from 0.8 to almost four millimeters in thickness and different types of sizes. They have been used for several years into dentistry and MaxFact surgery and they've proven to be very good. There are a couple of papers out um, about the use of those ones. Um, they do incorporate well into the tissues. 
they, they need the vascularized tissue and they do this like seroma formation. I think sometimes people fail when they use allografts. It is because they're taking the, um, the tubes out too quickly. What this material requires to stay alive is it requires neighbors that are alive. It <coughs> requires neighbors that they will allow it to revascularize, to have a tissue and growth, cell proliferation. If you take it out too early, you allow liquid to force itself in between the layer of the normal tissue and that material, and essentially what it does, it melts away. And if it doesn't melt away, it bulges. So your patient comes back, again, with the same problems that he had before. If we look at the xenograft, we have um, XCM patch from Synthesis DPE, which is a porcine one. We have the Permacol, we have the Veritas and the Tutor patch. I think they are very similar with, um, with, with essentially the, the previous category. What I found myself the best use, as I said before, I have found some of those very um, difficult to deal with. If you, have, if you have a proper square in the chest wall, which has been surrounded by osseous tissue, it's very easy to, to essentially put a patch on and go home, and you won't have any problems. Because what happens essentially is by normal human physiology, that space will retract, you will have surrounding fibrous tissue, so nature is going to help you achieve what you want, and you will feel very proud of yourself that you have done a good job. But start migrating towards the right and the upper and the left upper quadrant and having essentially no tissue to deal with and also a positive pressure into the abdominal cavity, I think this is where you get yourself into trouble. And these are the patients that they come back with problems and they, they do need actually very complex operations to have the, the hernias sorted out. We'll go a little bit into the Robocop stuff because we have Bob Cefolio here. Who is, who is doing all the singing, dancing business <laughs> with the robots. Um, I find those ones very impressive when the people send the pictures out. But I was always thinking, do I really need to replace a sternum with two and a half kilograms of metal? Is it really necessary? And how is this thing going to integrate into, into human tissues? And if it does integrate into human tissues, is it going to stay there forever? Or sooner or later, it will find its way somewhere, and then you will have to go and take it out. But yes, it, it is a situation where, where you, can, you can use it, and there are, there are reports about it. In a similar fashion, it's people that they, in their quest of creating new tissues, they've gone into the lab, they've used the 3D printing techniques, and they have produced all these materials. I think they're very bulky. They never integrate. You will have a later re reaction with needing for a future surgery. I don't think that they do have a long-term stability, and obviously they are fairly expensive, and they are not available on the shelf. It takes a lot, a lot of time and, and a lot of effort to get the CT sorted out, send it across, measure, and sometimes those people that we deal with malignant disease, they are not going to wait for a month for us to actually give them an operation. They want it the same evening or the previous night if it was if it was actually possible. I found this paper very interesting. It came out actually this year from the group of Fred Federico Ria and Giuseppe Marulli. This might be a little bit of an answer in the future by using, by using essentially cadaveric implants. That might work. As long as we do have answers in the future on their own or in combination with stem cells, whether those they will develop a beating heart, whether they will become alive. Because if they do not become alive, then they will have the fate of whatever we use at the moment. And I think this is, this is very, very important to remember. So I hear very often people talking about the best available materials. I don't, think, I don't believe in that statement. You have to use the best suitable materials. Every single patient is an entity on its own. A chest wall resection is never the same chest wall resection. You have to look at the patient, you have to look at his nutritional status, you have to look at the integrity of the tissues, you have to look at the system you work, the place you are, the support that you have outside, and then and there you're going to decide the materials that you will have to use for these patients. So somebody with a malignant sarcoma is not the same with, with somebody who might have an infected area into his costal arch, and it's not exactly the same with somebody that he might need a very extensive pectus um, re a repair. Three things that you need to remember, and I, I think that those three things apply for me. I know that sometimes we as surgeons go in a very aggressive way, 
whatever we use for chest wall um, reconstructions, it has to be simple. It has to be very cost effective. And I think what we have to see is whether we can produce materials that they will remain alive. So I would like to thank everyone for your attention. Um, and please remember, we have the best thoracic meeting in Innsbruck this year from the European Society of Thoracic Surgery. We're expecting each and every one of you to be there by the end of May. Thank you very much.